Uh, today is June 6, 1995, and we are in Gainesville at the University of Florida in the Department of Anesthesiology to interview Dr. Jerome Modell, who has been the chairman of our department for many years. And this is our opportunity to get to know him a little bit. And it occurred to me, Jerry, that uh, I've known you since 1969 or 1968, something like this. Yes, sir. November 1968, I think is. Uh, okay. Actually, we knew each other before that, but uh, that's a time that I actually visited the University of Florida when you had decided to leave and go yeah. to Cleveland. Well, in uh, thinking about this, it occurred to me that for all those years where, where I, I was aware of you and then I worked with you, I never really got to know you as well as uh, was true last week when we had a chance to talk about this interview because that was the first time I heard a little bit about your family and your background. And you really, I mean, this is an American success story. Well, uh, thank you. Which I, I has, has just an awful lot of uh, interesting facets and, and uh, wonderful details. And I think that uh, I should start out asking you to tell me a little bit about your parents and their parents and where they came from and your beginnings. Well, my, uh, <coughs> my father's family came from Shatoma, Russia, in the Ukraine. And uh, my mother's family came from Brest-Litovsk in Poland, which I have never been there, but I understand they're not terribly far apart. I, during the time of the First World War, and I don't know the exact year, uh, both families migrated to the United States. Their, their trip was uh, not a pleasant one as I understand it. Uh, my mother and father were both youngsters at the time, somewhere under 10 years of age. <clears throat> and both of their, their fathers had come to the United States uh, before their mothers and the children in an attempt to get a job, make enough money to send for their families. Uh, during the interim, uh, both families lost touch with their father. And my mother's family, uh, her mother and the children uh, migrated from Poland. Uh, as I understand it, the trip was very eventful in as much as the oldest child at that time was 13 and their mother died of the plague on the, on the way so that they, uh, the children all ended up in Ellis, Ellis Island, as many people did at that time, and eventually found their way to St. Paul, Minnesota, where their father was. Uh, my father's family was a bit different, uh, and that is uh, his mother and himself and his brothers and sister. Uh, I really didn't know anything about this until about 15 years ago when, when my aunt wrote a book. And uh, the, the motivation was, I guess, uh, is really, uh, it, it was a success story from their standpoint in that they came here as, uh, as uh, refugee children and ended up being very, very successful. And the proceeds of that book, she's donated every cent of it to charity. I don't think they've sold very many, but, <laughs> but uh, nevertheless. But in reading that, the first chapter actually starts out where my father, his siblings, and his mother were lined up against the wall in front of a firing squad of the Tsar's army. And uh, for no apparent good reason uh, other than at that point in history, it wasn't very popular to be Jewish in the Tsarist Russia. And uh, the people whose house they were at, uh, according to the, to the writings of my aunt, uh, convinced the soldiers to come back the next day. And during that night, they smuggled them out of the town and they began their trek to the United States. And they too ended up in Ellis Island and they found their father in St. Paul, Minnesota. And so began uh, the history of the two families. Uh, my mother's maiden name was Singer, and my father's name actually was Modelewski. And he changed it to Model, as I understand. When he was about 20 years old, he got a job selling insurance for the John Hancock Insurance Company, and the people he called upon couldn't pronounce Modelewski, so he used the first five letters, put another L on it, and that's how the Model family started. <laughs> okay. It, it 
couldn't be a more dramatic beginning of a arrival in the United States uh, as that. Now, with, with that beginning, um, what are your early childhood memories uh, growing up uh, in this family with this uh, spectacular background? Uh, education was, uh, was not an option. It was a necessity. And uh, uh, everybody in the family took pride every time any one of the you know, children, grandchildren, whatever, became educated, and part particularly to go to professional school. I mean, that was the, if you did that, you know, you kind of sat at the head of the table, so to speak. Uh, let's go back to college. Where did you go to college? I went to the University of Minnesota, uh, both undergraduate school and, and to medical school, and graduated medical school in 1957. Let's, let's go back to, uh, to your earlier days, uh, medical school, you did some research while you were in medical school. Yes, sir. I was very fortunate uh, to meet uh, someone, I think it was my last year of pre-med, uh, Dr. Samuel Schwartz. Dr. Schwartz was a professor of medicine at the University of Minnesota and he had spent his whole career in research. Uh, Dr. Schwartz and Dr. Cecil Watson, who was the chairman of the Department of Medicine, had uh, I, I, I believe that uh, the two of them are probably responsible for uh, almost everything we know about porphyria. And uh, they were the ones that I believe originally uh, discovered the one minute in total bilirubin test and so on. Uh, Dr. Schwartz was interested uh, in hematoporphyrin and, and protoporphyrin. And what, whether these could be used, I guess you would say it was a precursor to chemotherapy. And uh, he was doing experiments on injecting these solutions into uh, first into animals, and then they did some human studies, and combining that with a radiation for tumors that were inoperable <coughs> and not known to be responsive to anything else, and really got some very dramatic results. And I was fortunate enough to work for Dr. Schwartz all during medical school, uh, starting out cleaning rabbit cages, and by the time I graduated, uh, I had the responsibility for running, I think it was two laboratories with with uh, people on physiologic studies in, in uh, animals in regard to the effects of hematoporphyrin. Now, um, somewhere in medical school, you joined the Navy. I did then go into the Navy after graduation of medical school and had my internship and residency in the Navy. I think I was in the service a total of about six and a half years. When you, when you became an intern, were you already headed in direction of anesthesia, or was that still open? No, sir. Uh, the only exposure I had to anesthesia was an elective at 6 a.m. in the morning with Dr. Matthews. You may remember Dr. Matthews from the University of Minnesota, uh, who was a very outgoing fellow. It was a popular elective, but never did I think I would go into anesthesiology. Uh, when I left the University of Minnesota, Dr. Watson had uh, essentially planned my life out. wasn't terribly happy I went into the military because that interrupted what he had planned for me. But uh, I was going to become an internist and, and come back and join the faculty at the University of Minnesota. Mm -hmm. uh, when I got to the U.S. Naval Hospital in St. Albans in Long Island and rotated through the various services and one month was spent on anesthesiology, uh, that kind of turned my life around. So uh, were there uh, people who influenced you in, in anesthesia at that time? Yes, sir. They had a very small department. Uh, Dan Pino was the chief of anesthesia, a lovely fellow. Uh, Bob Van Houten was a member of the faculty. And uh, Bob is kind of a legend in the Navy, uh, a very charismatic type individual, very outspoken and very, very excellent teacher. But I, I guess the thing that really made a difference is we had probably the most spectacular visiting professor program that anybody in the country has ever had. We had four consultants uh, uh, to, to, the, to the Naval Hospital there. And each one of them would, uh, would spend one day a month uh, there at the Naval Hospital. And uh, Manny Papper was one, Lou Orkin was another. Uh, uh, Merrill Harmel was another, uh, and so that you really had an opportunity to interact with these people uh, every week. And, uh, you know, I kept in touch with these folks. Uh, 
Manny Pamper, I think more than anybody else, uh, has helped guide me through an entire career. It seems every time I had to make a decision, suddenly he was there to talk to. How, I don't know, but I'm not unique. Other people will tell you that about Manny also. And uh, uh, Lou was wonderful to me, uh, uh, so was Merle. And well, those of us with white hair uh, remember the ether days. How did you get started in that? Well, the fourth consultant we had was Lou Wright, who you may have known. Uh, and uh, Dr. Wright uh, taught me how to do open drop ether. I'll, I'll, I'll never forget it. Uh, we sat on, a, on, a, on two little stools in the, in the anesthesia workroom, which was like a closet. And uh, he crossed his legs, and we put together an ether mask by putting gauze on the Yankower mask, and sat there with it on his knee and taught me how the first drop takes a second, then the second second you put on two drops, a third three drops, a four fourth drops, and you do this in a circle. So it has an opportunity to evaporate so you don't saturate it and drip ether into the patient. And uh, when it was my turn to do that, I can remember uh, getting a little vigorous with it and him grabbing my hand in the can and saying, no, it's open drop, not open pour. <laughs> and uh, sure enough, uh, that afternoon I did my first open drop ether anesthetic. With, a, with an ether can, uh, with a cork, or with a safety pin? How did you do that? Well, I've done it both ways. But uh, I can't remember that particular day which, which way it was. But I preferred the cork in the, in the little wick. The where little wick. We'd take and cut a little V out of the cork and put a wick in it. Uh, to me, that was easier than the and putting the safety pin in, I thought I had a little better control with it. Uh, I per think to, to, the, to the younger generation, you have <coughs> to explain how the safety pin thing worked, because that's well, not Well, you just put a safety pin through the top of the ether can, and uh, as you would tip it, it would, it would drip off the end of the safety pin. And this was possible because the top of the ether can was of very soft metal. Yes, sir. Yes, and sir. If, you wanted, you know, if you wanted to increase the flow, you just put your hand around it, which heated it up, which increased the, the, uh, the flow of ether out of it by increasing the temperature. Gets you into physics of anesthesia. That was something I didn't do well with early on. I remember Macintosh and Mushin's book, no matter how many times I read it, Nick, I really never, I don't think, understood it until I became a faculty member. Uh -huh. And then I had to teach it to somebody else. So, but as a resident, that particular textbook didn't turn me on. Uh, Jerry, uh, over the years you've become very prominent in intensive care unit and respiratory care. Where did that start? Well, the, uh, the first exposure to that actually was uh, when I was at the Naval Hospital in St. Albans. Uh, my next door neighbor was a fellow named Ross Moquin who was an internal medicine resident. I was an anesthesia resident. and. Uh, our families were very close. Our kids played together. I mean, we literally lived in, uh, in houses that were separated by a thin wall. You could hear the people next door uh, if, if, if they were talking loud or the radio was up. And uh, Ross and I, uh, I guess we both got frustrated about the same time that if we had patients that needed oxygen or something, it was very, very difficult to, to get it accomplished. Uh, so we went to the CO, uh, to the commanding officer of the hospital, uh, who gave us permission to collect everything and anything that might be used for, in those days, what we called inhalation therapy. And what we did is, between a Christmas and New Year's, uh, we literally went with wheelbarrows from ward to ward, going through every drawer, collecting oxygen masks and tubings and regulators and whatever there was. Respirators, there were very few of them in those days. Uh, and we inventoried everything. We brought them together. What, what, they, what is the year of this, approximately? Well, I started my internship in, uh, in July of 57. So this would have probably been about a year after that, 58. probably in 58. Uh, but we, uh, they gave us a corpsman, and, and we, we educated that corpsman as best we could, if you will, in how to repair these things. Uh, Repair contracts weren't in existence uh, very, in very many places in those days. We cataloged everything, we fixed the equipment, and we developed uh, what now I guess you would call a respiratory therapy department. Uh, from there, 
uh, that was quite successful. Uh, we then went on to, uh, uh, I guess, complain that our very sick patients were all over the place. This is a 1,300-bed hospital. So that we were given permission to bring them all into one ward. And uh, you might say that was the beginning of an intensive care unit. Uh, it was very crude. We obviously didn't have the type of monitoring equipment we have today, and, and we didn't have the type of mechanical ventilators and so on we had today. But that's how we started. And if we needed other things, uh, not infrequently, we would go down to the plumbing shop or the machine shop and try to make something that would work for that particular situation. Uh, when I was transferred from the Naval Hospital in Long Island to the Naval Hospital in Pensacola, I had uh, what in retrospect was a very unique opportunity. At the time was a real tragedy. And that is that uh, an exchange student from the Japanese Navy was there at flight school and uh, was swimming underwater, doing underwater endurance swimming at the officer's pool and, and stopped. And in retrospect, this is what some people now call a you know, blackout drowning type thing from hyperventilation. And uh, he, was, he was given mouth to mouth and close chest massage, brought to the emergency room of the Naval Hospital in Pensacola. And I was at the other pool and ran up the hill, was called to, to take care of him. And I had never seen a drowning victim in my life, but we did take care of him. We did not have intensive care units. We didn't have blood gas machines and all these things. But essentially, uh, we took uh, one hospital room, got three dedicated nurses, had them take care of him around the clock, and uh, I slept in one bed occasionally while he was in the other one, and we literally lived with this fellow for some time and uh, took care of him. And at about the second or third day, he woke up and uh, subsequently recovered. And that's where my interest in drowning started. And once I then got out of the Navy in 1963 and went to Miami, uh, that was the thing that I had decided that I would subspecialize in would be respiratory therapy and intensive care and, and uh, establish a department there and a ICU there and so on and got into doing research in mechanical ventilation and that's how it all started. Conceptually, what, what are some of the, the, the most important points that you uh, emphasize when you teach people about drowning or near drowning? I mean, you have uh, been so central in this effort. You've published on it. There's a book out <coughs> on it. Um, if I realize that you cannot give a whole lecture here on drowning. At least I hope you won't. I'd rather not. <laughs> uh, but <coughs> but uh, the important points that came out of your work? Um. Well, you might, you might go back to this one patient I had because, as I told you, I'd never seen a case of drowning before. I'd, I may have read about it, but I don't remember reading about it. And uh, the, the medical library was right next door to the emergency room there. And I did have them pull a book and started reading about it. And, and what I read was the, the very excellent work that Dr. Henry Swan had done in the mid to late 40s in Galveston. Uh, but my patient didn't fit anything that he had done in animals. Uh, and what he had done actually was to, uh, was to drown dogs. And then some of them fibrillated in fresh water. Seawater ones didn't. There were massive electrolyte changes and so on. And, and my patient had normal electrolytes. He didn't fibrillate. He rested, but he didn't fibrillate that we know of. Uh, and, and that's what led me to believe that maybe dogs and humans are different. Uh, and when I got to Miami and had the opportunity then to have access to a research laboratory, I began doing controlled studies and anesthetized animals and be able to compare that to what we saw in humans. Uh, living in Miami, access to human drowning victims was easy. And uh, I developed a friendship with uh, Dr. Joe Davis, who was a medical examiner for Dade County, terrific individual in forensic medicine. And together we convinced the uh, fire and rescue people in Miami to work together with us. So we actually developed a system whereby the minute they retrieved a drowning or near drowning victim, we were called and we met them in the emergency room with a team that two members of the team would treat the patient and the other two would draw specimens. So we were able to, if you will, to evaluate biochemically and blood gas wise and so on what was happening. And to my knowledge, that was the first organized effort to be able to do that. 
what we actually found was, uh, if I can condense 25 years of studies into a couple minutes, is that the studies that Swan had done were under conditions of total immersion. And actually, uh, only about 15% of humans who die in the water aspirate that much water. Most of them aspirate considerably less than that. Uh, and of the ones that actually get to the hospital alive, they probably, virtually all of them aspirate less than that. So the problem is not one of massive electrolyte changes, not hemolysis of blood, <coughs> not ventricular fibrillation, et cetera, but rather it's primarily the pulmonary effects of uh, the aspiration of water uh, in seawater drowning uh, resulting in fluid filled but perfused alveoli and therefore a shunt. And in fresh water, uh, it, it changes the surface tension of pulmonary surfactant, so you end up with unstable alveoli, which also gives you intrapulmonary shunt. Uh, and our, our research was focused on that. Uh, then as newer methods of monitoring the cardiovascular system came into effect, we were able to look at changes in, in distribution of fluid and changes in blood volume and the need for fluid replacement and that sort of thing. So that uh, at the present time, I think most people are very comfortable with that aspect of it. And what we're left with is those patients that have had irreversible cerebral hypoxia prior to the successful resuscitation. And uh, that to me is a new, is the next horizon uh, in, in the treatment of, of drowning victims. Now, uh, so your important <coughs> contribution and, and impact of your work has been on the, really on the early care, diagnosis and early care and resuscitation of uh, near drowning victims. Yes, has sir. There not, has there not been some controversy of some, some aspects that I recall having seen you rather angry once upon a time? Oh, I don't think I ever get angry, Nick. You must have been talking about someone else. Let's not... Uh, uh, there, there is, uh, I don't know what controversy you're talking about unless it's Dr. Heimlich's views, uh, which incidentally, uh, I just got a uh, clipping from the Pittsburgh newspaper about that. Uh, Dr. Heimlich has been proposing for several years that that one should treat drowning victims with a Heimlich maneuver, not with, with basic CPR. And, and I, as well as uh, almost everyone else that I know of who's actually studied drowning, except for Dr. Heimlich and his disciples, uh, agree that that's not the best thing to do. Uh, the, the volume of water that's aspirated is not large in most, in most victims. Uh, with freshwater aspiration, it's absorbed rapidly into the circulation, so you can't get it out anyhow because it's not there and so on. Uh, and this last year, 1994, the uh, Institute of Medicine uh, appointed a select committee to gather the scientific data in regard to whether a Heimlich maneuver was or was not the proper thing to do. And they issued their report and they concluded that, uh, that uh, the work that we and others uh, like Ornato and, and uh, Saffer and so on had done, uh, had conclusively shown that uh, the best way to treat these patients was initially with CPR, not with the Heimlich maneuver. Uh, from this newspaper article I just got in the mail yesterday from Pittsburgh, uh, Dr. Heimlich apparently has gone back to the lay press to try to plead his case and, and complain that the uh, Institute of Medicine uh, I think he used the word study was, quote, fraudulent, unquote. Oh. On what basis, I don't know. But I, 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 that's Dr. Heimlich's problem, not mine. I, as I've said many times, I think he's to be commended for introducing the Heimlich maneuver that hit his, I believe, probably saved countless lives from choking. But it doesn't cure everything. Jerry, this interest in drowning and near drowning and people with uh water-filled or partially water-filled lungs. Uh, did, did that get you into an, another question of respiratory physiology? Well, it actually led into, into several things. Uh, it, I think you might safely say that that's where my interest in, in uh, intensive pulmonary support came in the broadest sense. Uh, that we got into later when, you know, Bob Kirby and Bud Klein and John Downs and Dave Desitels and, and others uh, joined us and we, we started to look at modes of mechanical ventilation, developed IMV and things like that. But 
Actually, the first uh, thing that sprang off from this, which, which now is suddenly entering in, into a little different but renewed popularity, is liquid ventilation. And uh, if you, you may recall, in the early 60s, Clark and Gollin uh, published a paper, I think it was in Science, if I'm not mistaken, where they took a perfluorinated hydrocarbon and they saturated with oxygen and they actually put mice in the liquid, submerged them in the liquid yeah. and had them breathe this and then took them out and shook them out, so to speak, uh, and, and they recovered. Uh, Frank Gollin was on the faculty at the University of Miami when I was there. And he was uh, uh, just a marvelous mentor and uh, a wonderfully bright person. You may remember many, many years before he talked about the benefits of CO2 and increasing cerebral circulation. He was, if not the first person, one of the first people that introduced the concept of uh, using hypothermia to mm -hmm. reduce ox okay. metabolism mm -hmm. and so on. I started working with Frank and we started doing some surfactant studies on puppies that had breathed pulmonary surfactant to, or, or breathed uh, fluorocarbon to see whether this affected them or not. And from there we actually went into very extensive studies in converting mammals to breathing liquid. Uh, we did this uh, uh, in rodents, we did this in, in canines, we actually did this in primates also. Uh, whereas we would anesthetize them and we would then ventilate them with fluorocarbon for long periods of time. Uh, the primates were for an hour. Some of the dogs we ventilated with fluorocarbon for as long as eight hours continuously and then reconverted them back to breathing air uh, and followed them for many, many years for long-term survival. Uh, we did pulmonary function studies on many of them. As a matter of fact, Dr. Uh, uh, Dina Saga Rumley, who's on the faculty at the University of Florida, that was her research project as a fellow. Uh, we did biochemical studies uh, to look at liver function and look at uh, hematology and things like that. And uh, really got it down to uh, pretty much of a science where we could predictably convert animals to breathing liquid uh, and then convert them back to breathing air with, uh, with no apparent damage to them from the things that we could measure. Uh, we stopped doing that type of research uh, within probably oh, three or four years of the time that I got here uh, for a couple of reasons. One, as you well know, is you chair a department, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. You have less and less time to spend on your personal research projects. The other thing had to do with, uh, it might tell a story, it might be interesting in retrospect, we talk about uh, the FDA and protecting people and so on. I, I actually had an allied chemical company design fluorocarbons to our specifications because the earlier material that we used from 3M company, the animals ended up with temporary lesions that looked almost like emphysema. So we had them design a fluorocarbon with a different vapor pressure whereby we didn't get those changes. And we were going to uh, use this material in humans with cystic fibrosis. And if you go back to the 60s, there wasn't much hope for those folks to actually wash out the thick, tenacious secretions in their lungs. That was the motivation behind it. And I went with the lawyers from Allied Chemical to Washington to the FDA to try to find out what we needed to do to get permission to do this. Uh, the people we met with there had decided that since there was very, very little, if any, absorption of this material into the bloodstream, that this wasn't a drug, it was a device. So they sent us to the Bureau of Devices, which had just been created within that year and had a director uh, and a secretary. Uh, in an office with boxes yet to be unpacked and without rules or regulations. And we presented uh, a very extensive three or four hour presentation with videotapes and scientific studies uh, showing uh, we had toxicity studies we had done, pulmonary function studies we had done, and so on, to which they concluded that that was all very interesting, but they really didn't have the authority to uh, grant us permission to use this in humans. And I asked the gentleman, well, what would you suggest? And he said, well, yeah, it looks pretty good to me, but uh, why don't you go ahead and use it? I mean, if anybody gets in trouble or a patient gets sick, then, you know, we'll come after you. Well, considering the fact that we were only going to take patients who were thought to be terminal or preterminal, uh, I mean, a normal healthy patient, there's no reason to do this. 
I, at that point, Allied Chemical decided to go out of the medical business, and they stopped production of fluorocarbon oh. and did away with that division. So uh, we never did anything after that, and it's interesting because I was just at a meeting, what well, was the AUA meeting last month, and someone in the audience came up and talked to me and said, uh, didn't you do some work with fluorocarbons many years ago? And uh, his interest in talking to me was is that he is one of the people now investigating the combination of fluorocarbon and air ventilation uh, in an attempt to help improve pulmonary function in people with, with alveolar prognosis. Mm -hmm. Well, um, in terms of, of drowning or near drowning or fishing people out of the water, you, you were involved also with the astronaut program, right? Yes, sir. Uh, when I was in the Navy, I was uh, fortunate enough to be appointed to the first medical re recovery team for Project Mercury so that uh, I had the pleasure, I think it was in 1962, I think it was, uh, of actually being out in the ocean while John Glenn was orbiting the Earth waiting for him to come down. Uh, he came down a different orbit. We didn't get him, but nevertheless, uh, uh, I was part of that program. I also was out for the Scott Carpenter flight. And uh, prior to that, we had the opportunity to visit Cape Canaveral and actually participate in the design of, the, of what would take place for medical recovery of the astronauts. Well, I think, f once again, for viewers who uh, remember uh, only the, the, the landings of uh, space shuttles now in Cape Kennedy or in California someplace, you might just say, <coughs> how did these uh, early astronauts land? Well, they landed by splashing into the Atlantic Ocean. They, they, uh, they didn't land, they seed, I guess. Well, they, there was a parachute on the capsule, so they came down uh, more gently than if they would just free fall, obviously. And uh, they, as I understand it, I was not there for any of them when they got out of the capsule, but uh, as I understand it, it was not a traumatic landing. But the capsule was out in the ocean, and they had to find it. And uh, you know, you're going back now 30-some uh, years. Uh, the methodology for doing that was, was good, but not quite as good as it is now. As a matter of fact, you may remember, uh, uh, since you are as old as I am, uh, Scott Carpenter, they got the message on the ground that the heat shield was coming loose, and they were thinking of aborting his flight and bringing him home early. And he went the full three, uh, uh, three circles around the Earth, but he ended up being several hundred miles off from where he was supposed to and took a little bit of time for them to find him. But the, the capsules were very small, they were cramped. The astronauts were essentially strapped into a, uh, or, or, or confined in a very small space in a chair that was molded to their body uh, and, and in a suit on top of that. So it wasn't the most comfortable thing in the world for them. But it was, it was an exciting time in history. Uh, you know, when you stop to think about it, many of People ask, you know, what do we get out of the space program? And if you go through an intensive care unit or an operating room now and you look at all the telemetry and all the monitoring equipment and so on, keep in mind that a, a large amount of that was a direct result of the space program. Without the space program, it probably would have been several more years before those things were developed. Now, in, in Miami, you got a uh, NIH Career Development Award. Yes, sir. Uh, in which, what was the subject of uh, study there? That was uh, for my drowning studies drowning. and related studies, yes, sir. Uh, I, I have uh, this, <coughs> this anecdote about uh, Dr. Van Dam when he was editor of uh, anesthesiology. I once wrote a paper and uh, I said, we created a table or something like this, and in his fine hand, he had written on the margin of the paper, uh, only God creates. And I've never, ever used create again in anything that I'm writing. And I think that you, too, had uh, uh, experiences and learned from Roy. Yes, as a matter of fact, he wrote exactly that same thing on one of my papers. Oh, he did? <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> I. When I was an assistant professor at Miami, I, it must have been, it could have been the first drowning paper ever submitted to anesthesiology. It was very early in my career. Uh, I sent in a paper that was, I don't remember exactly how long it was, but it was probably maybe six or seven pages double-spaced. 
And I got back a very lovely letter from Dr. Van Dam saying that he thought that this was very important work and it had been done very well, whatever, I don't remember the exact verbiage on it, but they had a few suggestions to improve it. And uh, he sent me about a 10-page single-space letter suggesting the improvements. And, you know, the first time you get one of these things, you sit back and as a youngster, you say he didn't understand what I was doing, how could he do this to me, and so on. And then suddenly you realize that here is a giant in the field who must have taken hours and hours or days to go through that paper and take the time to point out to you how to improve it. So instead of one of resentment, I mean, I, be, I really became extremely grateful and did revise the paper. And I can, as I sit here today, I can tell you that he was right in virtually everything, if not everything, <laughs> that he said. And I learned a tremendous amount about not only writing papers, but how to design future experiments and things like that. And uh, that, to me, is a unique talent. Uh, I mean, as you know, we both have been on editorial boards of, of journals. I, I've got to admit, I never have taken as much time as Roy did. I, I, I don't have the patience to do that. I, I'm sure some of the authors who got my comments back that may have been several pages thought I spent months doing this. but. Uh, that was a, a rare talent and a commitment of Dr. Van Dam to the assistance and development of young people who he had never met that I've never seen anything like it before or after. And yeah, I think it's wonderful. Uh, in Miami, you, um, your academic career developed under the influence of Dr. Papa? Uh, actually, Frank Moya was the chairman in Miami. And Frank, as you know, had come to Miami from Columbia. And uh, Frank gave me an enormous amount of opportunity to grow and develop. Uh, Manny Papper, it seemed, uh, always showed up when I needed him. You know, you mentioned a career development award. I never thought of applying for a career development award. And Manny Papper came there as a visiting professor uh, for a week. And I think it was uh, on Tuesday. Uh, we sat down and just sat and chatted for an hour or two about what I was doing and where I was going and what my goals were and so on. Uh, at the conclusion of that day, uh, without telling me so, but just the way Manny is, I knew I had to apply for a career development award and the deadline was Friday. So uh, over the course of the next couple of days, I put that together with, with his guidance and uh, got it to Washington, and I ended up with a career development award. Uh, when I was coming to the University of Florida, just fortuitously, Manny and I happened to get stuck at the Miami airport waiting for a plane at the same time. And uh, I had just interviewed at Florida, because you had resigned to leave, and Manny had just interviewed as a, for the deanship in Miami. And after spending a couple of hours uh, with Manny, uh, I knew that if I was offered the position at Florida, I would take it. Uh, it's the kind of influence he has on you. Uh, well, Frank, on the other hand, w was different. Frank would delegate an enormous number of things. Uh, sometimes I thought he was dumping on me. There were so many. But in retrospect, uh, I, I have to say that uh, I'm very appreciative because he gave me the opportunity to learn how to run a residency program. He gave me the opportunity to organize and run a medical student program. Uh, I was uh, uh, encouraged to do research. He was supportive of that. I learned an awful lot about postgraduate medical education and actually uh, for a year ran postgraduate education at the University of Miami for the medical school, or coordinated it, I should say. It, it, it almost ran itself uh, with the various chairman of the departments. And uh, Frank uh, got me very active in the American Society of Anesthesiologists. Uh, and uh, as I sit back and look, those things don't happen by themselves. Somebody nominates you, somebody gets you there. And, and he was very instrumental in my entire career. <coughs> and uh, you know, then for a few years after I left there, I guess we were, ended up as competitors competing for residents in the same state. And uh, Frank and I, uh, like Manny and I, got stuck in the airport. Frank and I got stuck in the airport a couple of months ago uh, for a couple of hours and sat there and reminisced. And uh, it, was, it was wonderful. It was, uh, 
uh, you know, we both kind of sat back and thought about the early 60s and how the department developed and, and that sort of thing, and, and I'm very grateful to him. Well, the, the department here in Gainesville, of course, it blossomed after you took over, and it, um, when you um, left the department in order to assume your, your current position, uh, it had grown to some 40 faculty and an excess of 80 residents. Yes, sir. From very modest beginnings in 1969 when you came. Well, you know, it's a different place. Uh, you know, to, to imply that uh, what's here is all my fault is not right. Uh, you, you don't blossom and bloom unless you have good roots and uh, you're responsible for that. Uh, the other thing is I was very fortunate <coughs> to have uh, some very, very dedicated people, which you had also. People like Darkel Anderson, Haven Perkins, and Connie DePadua, who would always sit behind the scenes. Uh, if I made a mistake, they would tell me about it, but they wouldn't get up and holler about it. Sometimes they didn't tell me, but I knew they knew I made a mistake. And those people uh, were really the backbone of the department. Uh, the other thing is the size of the institution was different. If you remember, when you left, you were running seven operating rooms. And I came here to run a department with seven operating rooms, thought that would be wonderful, because then I can still run my research lab full time and do all these other things I wanted to do. And within uh, two weeks of the time I got here, they opened two more operating rooms. And within the next six months, they opened four more operating rooms. And uh, now we must have, between the, both sides of the street, about 30 anesthetizing locations. There were no intensive care units, as you recall, in those days. And uh, in 1970, we opened the pediatric intensive care unit, which the Department of Anesthesiology ran and still does. Uh, the surgical ICU was just a couple of beds in back of recovery room at that time, and now is a, is a very large and booming uh, enterprise. Uh, so that as the institution grew, I was very, very fortunate to have people like Perk and Torkel and Connie to, to, to make sure the basics got done while I could then recruit young people with different interests and, and hopefully give them the opportunity to grow and develop and mature into stars of their own in their own right. And I was very fortunate that uh, the right people came here. And as well, you know, some are still here. Uh, others have gone on to become chairman elsewhere and that sort yeah. of thing. Well, Jerry, the, uh, your chairmanship at the University of Florida Department of Anesthesiology certainly is one of the success stories of your career. And I think there's a wonderful recognition of this in uh, a name professorship. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, last year uh, at the residence graduation party, I was surprised and honored in that the uh, a uh, endowed professorship uh, in my name was established. I think that that is very nice, and there are relatively few professorships named after people who are still alive. You can count yourself very lucky. I never thought about that. <laughs> I, I, I hope that wasn't a wish on the part of my, of my I, friends. But I, uh, it was, as a matter of fact, I, I have a plaque that they gave to me. Actually, this was at the residence graduation last year. And you might remember it got very, very late. And I had, I think I've been traveling during the daytime. And I mentioned to Shirley that, you know, I, we should sneak out the back because I really had to go to sleep and this they stayed to the end and she managed to keep me there <coughs> which of course I was very grateful for but uh, but it's uh, it, it was a real honor and I was very much honored and very thankful uh, that was for the University of Florida to recognize your contributions now you have served on, on many committees and have chaired uh, organizations and things like that uh, among them the AUA yes sir <laughs> yes, I've been uh, I've been secretary and then and then president of the Association of University Anesthesiologists. I've been president of the Society of Academic Anesthesia Chairs. Uh, I've been the president of Florida Society of Anesthesiologists. I've 
served on many committees and, and chaired many committees, as you know, the American Society of Anesthesiologists. Uh, uh, some of them, I can't remember all of them, I don't think, but the Governmental Affairs Committee, uh, the uh, Refresher Course Committee, uh, the Continuing Education Committee, uh, the Annual Meeting Committee, uh, you know, are some that, that come to mind offhand. Has that um, helped you in, <clears throat> in your current uh, position? The, I mean, your work now is really no longer in anesthesia, but uh, deals with uh, the new realities of medicine. Can, can oh, I think it's very helpful. I, uh, as you know, my current title is very long, but it's the uh, Associate Vice President for University of Florida Health Science Center Affiliations. That is a uh, long title, and I'm it, glad I It is know. a long title, and it's hard to abbreviate, unfortunately. But uh, my responsibilities are many, uh, including uh, the uh, developing affiliations throughout the state of Florida, both clinical and academic uh, for the health center. And we've been very fortunate in that we do have affiliations in all parts of the state, uh, which uh, some of them are purely educational. Uh, some of them relate to uh, to clinical care. Uh, some of them combine clinical research with it and so on. Uh, also, uh, I, I oversee the, uh, the section of the vice president's office that deals with uh, contracting for all of the colleges, not just the College of Medicine, but also the College of Nursing, Pharmacy, Health-Related Professions, Dentistry, and, and Veterinary Medicine. And uh, the other uh, element that I'm responsible for is the we have a self-insurance trust fund which is our medical liability carrier as you know for the health center here in Jacksonville and those people report to me as well for the past few years I also have been the representative of of the faculty in the College of Medicine and negotiation of of insurance contracts like for managed care and that sort of thing uh, we're undergoing reorganization now and we'll be hiring someone else to take that that aspect of it over but the fact that I've been active uh, on the national scene if you will in anesthesiology and and particularly in uh, in governmental affairs and and uh, at one time uh, was one of the three people that represented anesthesia to HICFA the healthcare finance administration etc uh, I think I learned a lot from that that puts me in a much better position to do what I'm supposed to be doing now well, this uh, <coughs> stepping out of uh, the narrower confines of an anesthesia department into the, the larger um, domain of um, what is happening in medicine in general now gives you a unique perspective. Uh, what is happening? What, what do you foresee for anesthesia? <coughs> where, where are we going? Nick, I wish I knew. Uh, You know, I, I, I'm still an anesthesiologist by heart, and I'm still a member of the board of directors of the Florida Society of Anesthesiologists and so on. But my everyday activities, I, I, I relate to, uh, to CEOs of healthcare facilities. I relate to representatives uh, and CEOs of insurance companies. I relate to uh, governmental agencies that sponsor health programs. Uh, I interact with, uh, with administrators, department chairs, etc., in multiple different disciplines uh, uh, on almost a daily basis and so on. And I've got to tell you that uh, anesthesia is something that uh, they all assume will be there. But I don't believe that most people understand really the intricacies of quality anesthesia. I don't think they understand why anesthesia is so safe today compared to what it was when you and I were residents. We have made tremendous strides and we haven't really informed people why. I, I believe that there are many people out there that truly don't understand whether anesthesia is the practice of medicine or the practice of nursing. Uh, we have talked so long about the anesthesia care team and you talk to people not in anesthesia as to what is the anesthesia care team and they don't know. 
they just assume that anesthesia will be given. They assume that they will wake up. They assume that advances will be made and so on. And I think at the same time, uh, I'm going to say something I may lift to regret, but I've been concerned the last couple of years as I relate to these other people and then look back at anesthesia and as I talk to people about negotiating contracts and you talk about managed care and you talk about capitation and so on. The anesthesia community, I'm generalizing and I shouldn't do that, but the impression that many of these people get is anesthesiologists are in it for the money. Uh, no, they won't be capitated because they won't make enough money. They will hold out to the bitter end. Uh, they believe that they should get paid more by supervising nurse anesthetists than if they did cases by themselves and so on. And to the person that doesn't understand uh, the importance of anesthesia, that's hard to comprehend. Uh, it, it really is. So I think that the field of anesthesiology has to emphasize discovery. And by that I mean research. Uh, that's how we got from that open drop ether can you were talking about till today. You know, open drop ether was a pretty good anesthetic in those days. Outside of the fact that it's stunk and outside of the fact that you puked your guts out and outside of the fact that it exploded and things like that, you know, we thought it was pretty good stuff. And uh, if we had stopped doing research and stopped discovery at that time, we wouldn't have the type of things that we have today. We wouldn't have the monitoring we have today. We wouldn't have made anesthesia safe. And, and we as anesthesiologists have done this. That message needs to get out. And anesthesiology is every bit as exciting as it was three, four years ago, five years ago, ten years ago, probably more so. Uh, it is the practice of intensive care on a patient-by-patient -patient basis in the operating room. It's a terrific specialty. It motivates you. It stimulates you all the time. That's why people should become anesthesiologists, not because it dictates what kind of a car you drive. Well, I think that's uh, a, a wonderful point at which to stop this interview. Uh, thank you, Jerry. Uh, I'm very pleased that uh, we have had an opportunity to capture this on tape and um, give people a chance to observe an, a success story, uh, to see somebody who has been prominent in the field, has contributed enormously, and finally has given a ringing endorsement of our specialty. Thank you, sir. Thanks.